All right, if you have your Bibles, if you will open up to this week's Parsha, which is Behalotka, uh, we are going to be in Numbers chapter, um, Numbers chapter 8. So if you'll open up uh, your scriptures, I will have the Parsha on the screen, but there's a lot of other passages we're going to read that will not be on the screen. I am really excited about, um, about this Parsha. You may not be as excited. You may, you may go like, well, yeah, duh. But I, I got really excited when I came across this. Um, but let's talk about the, the, the Parsha, uh, just summarizing a little bit. Uh, Behalotka uh, is, means when you set up. Uh, when you put together, when you assemble uh, in that, that vein. Um, and there's a lot of assembling that goes on or putting together or setting up. There's a lot of setting up that goes on in this particular Parsha. So it's interesting that the Parsha opens with when you set up or when you assemble, when you put together. And what's the first thing that it talks about, all of you that read the Parsha? The lampstand, the menorah, right? And so... We can think and we can, you know, we can kind of be settled on that and go, well, Behalotka, when you set up, has to deal with the lampstand. But this Parsha is so cool because the idea of setting up, assembling, putting together, runs, that theme runs through the entire Parsha. And we see things happening over and over and over again. Um, so uh, this is the 36th portion in the year. Um, and... Uh, it's the third in the book of Numbers. So in this Parsha is covered the menorah, um, the consecration of the Levites, which is another uh, setting up or assembling. And that's, that's where we're going to focus on today is the consecration of the Levites, the Leviim. Uh, the institution of the second Passover, Pesach Sheni, uh, which is really important. Uh, the pillars of cloud and fire that led the Israelites uh, and there's some really interesting stuff. If you haven't done a deep dive on the cloud and the, uh, and the fire, um, it's really interesting. Just for instance, one commentary I read said, or one translation I read said, um, it was a, a cloud that appeared as fire or looked like in the form of fire. And I was thinking, how does a cloud look like fire? I don't know, it's just interesting. So uh, it also tells about the silver trumpets now, I know that everybody in the Hebrew Roots movement, Messianic movement, we love, we love the, um, what do you call this? Shofar, thank you. We lo- I'm sorry. We love the shofar, right? We, we love it. We want to blow it all the time. We want to hear it all the time. And we, I, I guess like for some reason we have this, this mindset that like this is real, like Israelite in the desert, like this is real. However, um, the shofar is not actually blown as much in the Tanakh, in the Bible, as you might think it is. And really, what, what is the main uh, sounding are trumpets, silver trumpets. And Hashem commanded Moshe to make two of these and uh, to blow them for departure when the, the, uh, the nation was getting ready to move. And then also as a signal to war whenever they uh, actually entered the land. They're actually silver, uh, silver trumpets. The sounds and the rhythms are the same. The sounds and the rhythms are very specific. There are, um, there are two sounds that are mentioned in our Parsha. And when you read about the silver trumpets, it's going to say like long blast or short blast or something like that. Real kind of vague terms. And the actual terms are tekiah and teruah. And so the teruah, which we have yom teruah, the day of trumpeting, right, or the day of sounding, the teruah is the short staccato. It's actually nine short staccato sounds that you hear when we blow it on Shabbat morning. And the tekiah is the long, the long blast at the end. Uh, so at the beginning, when we blow shofar on, on, on Shabbat morning, you might not even have known this. Do you realize that there's a method to the blowing of the shofar um, that we do? It, it's on purpose. And it comes from the, from the, uh, the, the, the service, the liturgy of uh, Rosh Hashanah, Yom Teruah. Um, so we start with a tekiah, a long blast. And then there's three short blasts. 
Then there's a trua, which is the staccato, the nine staccato blast. And then the last one is called tekia gedola, which is the great, the great blast uh, at, the, at the end. It's in the uh, Rosh Hashanah liturgy. Uh, we'll, we'll do it this year. It's, the, it's called the last trump. Right? So really, really, really cool stuff. So that's talked about in this Parsha, um, as well as uh, how the Israelites are going to move out on their journey, which is another cool um, cool thing. How do you, when you think about the Israelites moving through the wilderness and marching in their journey, how do, what kind of shape do you think about? Column, right? Like a long, a long column, right? Anybody else? Or is that pretty much like everybody's got a column in their mind? Like a long snake making it, like a herd, just like a crowd? Well, what's interesting, and the reason why I asked that question is because the rabbis have thought a lot about this, of course. Um, but what's interesting is that the, which, do you know which tribe moved first? Always first. No, all, they're always the first. They're not the first born, but they're the first. No, nope, not the Levites. They're number four in the family. Think about Genesis and the blessings. Judah, Judah. You charismatics ought to know this because Judah means praise, right? And praise goes first, right? You assembly of God people and Pentecostals, right? All right, sorry. So Judah always goes first. Who always goes last? Who was commanded to go last? Oh, this is a good one. Dan. Now, Dan goes last. Dan is a really peculiar study because... Dan, I don't know, Dan ends up being one of the tribes that doesn't show up in the book of Revelation. Is that right, Revelation? Dan's just not there among the counting of the tribes. But in the Torah, in the commandment, Dan is, um, there's several different ways you can translate the name Dan. But one of the ways is like um, uh, a dragnet or like a, the the cleanup crew kind of is, is, is kind of how to think about it. So Dan was the biggest tribe in numbers of the nation of Israel, of the tribes of Israel. Dan was put at the back, number one, to be the rear guard, to watch for enemies that would try to attack from, the, from behind. Who is famous for that? We're told to remember to forget the Amalekites, right? But they were also kind of the cleanup crew. They made sure that anyone who left late Elderly, those that couldn't move as fast, that they were taken care of. Also, if people forgot stuff, you ever left a vacation, you ever left a trip and forgot stuff, right? They were, they were the ones that kind of swept up everything and, and, and moved in behind. So the, the rabbis have talked about, the sages have talked about this idea that it may have very well been a column, but there were so many of Dan that it may have actually looked more like a diamond. And Dan kind of wrapped around the whole backside. And covered the wings, so to, so to speak. So just, just interesting stuff. Um, and then we have the complaints of the Israelites, which is when I first started really studying the Torah, I had never read this before. And so if you didn't read it this, this, this week, uh, first of all, shame on you. Second of all, um, the Israelites go, we could have meat in Egypt. They were complaining because they didn't have meat, right? Well, an interesting fact is that actually two of the tribes of Israel... That's what they did, is they were shepherds, they were herders, they raised meat. So the true fact is that Israel had meat available. But what was their complaint? We got it for free in Egypt, right? I mean, no mind that you were bound slaves, you got it for free. And there's a huge lesson in that for us, that how many times do we think we're getting something for free when we're really getting snookered, right? Right? And, and, and sometimes we want the things that are, that are easy, even though they're actually harder in the long run. And, and that... I'm lifted, I know. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> and all the active duty military said, amen. No. So this, so this, is, this is a huge lesson for us in, in that. But they, they complain about not having meat. And there's one other thing in particular they complain about that I find really interesting. That they, they complain that they don't have leeks. Now, have you ever eaten leeks? Yeah. Is it something that you go like, man, it's been like three weeks, and I haven't had any leeks. I really miss my leeks. 
not like they're bad, but it's just like leaks. Like, I don't. Okay, well, all right. If you're a soup person, I guess. So, so what I love most about this is God's response. And God goes, "Oh, you want meat? You're gonna eat so much meat that it's gonna come out of your nose. Literally, you're gonna throw it up. It's gonna make you nauseous." And I just, I, this is one of those other parts of of Hashem and his interactions with the people that I find really human in a, in a way, really relatable in a way. Um, because how many of us as parents haven't said something close to that effect, right? Um, and so uh, that's, a, that's an awesome part of the, of the, the Parsha. Um, and then uh, we have Miriam and Aaron uh, speaking against Moshe, and Miriam uh, gets struck with Zarat, right? Um, I I want to stop calling it leprosy because we have that idea that it's like Hansen's disease, and that's not it. Zarat, uh, which is a, a spiritual skin, uh, you know, disease that that comes from Hashem, usually for lashon hara or evil speech. And uh, I found something really. I'm just throwing at y'all like all like weird kind of stuff, but I just because this parsha is packed full of stuff. Um, so the question is, what did Miriam say? Right? What did Miriam say? that caused God to strike her with Zerat. She spoke against Moses, the scripture says, on account of the Cushite woman. Well, who's the Cushite woman? His wife, except she's not from Cush. She's from Ethiopia. So what is going on here, and what did Miriam say? There's a little backstory behind Miriam. Did you know that the, the sages account the water from the rock, right? You guys know about the water from the rock, right? How do they get water from a rock? The sages say that it was in Miriam's merit because of who Miriam was and because of the woman of righteousness that she was that that's the way that God, uh, he, or her merit is how he provided water for Israel. So when Miriam gets struck with Zarat after whatever she said, which I'm going to give you an opinion I think is really interesting, whatever she said, Israel goes without water for that period of time because she's in isolation. Just an, an interesting backstory. So what did Miriam say? Well, one of the opinions, and there are a lot out there, as you can imagine, one of the opinions that I find really interesting is that she is, first of all, called a Cushite woman. She's from Ethiopia, right? Um, and so why that thing? Well, because it was customary that a, a beautiful woman as Zipporah was, would be called by a less beautiful name, kind of like a dogmatic term, as a way of referring to them. And it's just a, it was a cultural thing. It happens in the Torah, several, in the Tanakh several times. But you have Moshe. Moshe had to be available to hear the voice of Hashem at all times, right? In a split second, God could say, Moshe say this, Moshe tell the children of Israel this, Moshe do this, Moshe do that, whatever. He had to always be, which in the, in the Jewish understanding, which means he had to be ritually pure at all times. Now, what is one act between a husband and wife that causes you to become ritually impure? Making babies. Re making babies, right. Thank you for that, because I was... Saying, I was trying to figure out how I'm going to say this. Yeah, relations, right? And so, Moshe, the, the, the opinion is Moshe and Zipporah did not have relations for an extended amount of time while they were moving and while Israel was all this. And this is what Miriam spoke up about and kind of castigated Zipporah for not having relationships with Moses. And this is why. This is the Lashan Hara. Because what Miriam didn't understand is that she didn't have to be available to God at all times. Yes, she was a leader of Israel, her and Aaron, but Moses had a different thing going on. He was not just called at appointed times. He was, had to be on call all the time. Morning, noon, night, middle of the night. And so Miriam and Aaron had the, the, the privilege to be able to you know, have relationships with their, their spouses without having to worry about that. Moses did not have that privilege. You know how we've talked about radial kedusha, and the closer you get to the presence, the more responsibility and the, the tighter things get, right? This is a great example of that. Miriam and Aaron are definitely leaders of Israel, 
But Moses is just a little bit in a little bit closer, and so there are certain things that he has to protect against. So see that this Parsha is in like four chapters. There's a ton of stuff. But I want to talk today about the consecration and the ordination of the Levites. Balloon. Because there's, there's something really fascinating in here. One of the questions that we, we get a lot and that we talk about a lot and that even in Christianity we've wondered is what kind of sacrifice was Yeshua? And we've talked about this. I did a whole couple of teachings on this, right? What kind of sacrifice was Yeshua? And most people, nine and a half out of ten, when you ask them what kind of sacrifice Yeshua was, they'll say what? Come on, be brave. Sin, sin a sin sacrifice, Right? That is the majority opinion, and I'm going to say this as respectfully as I can, amongst people who know absolutely nothing about the sacrifices. This is the majority opinion. However, there are some big problems with that, right? Number one, what is the chatat or the sin or purification sacrifice? Is it for intentional or unintentional sin? Unintentional. A chatat cannot atone for intentional sin. Cannot at all. Well, what is our problem? Is our problem intentional or unintentional? A little bit of both, but more intentional. So that doesn't work. It just, well, yeah, but, no, yeah, but. It just doesn't work. As a matter of fact, Israel gets in a lot of trouble with the prophets, or with God through the prophets, because they are continually bringing Hatat offerings and going doing whatever they want to anyway to the point where God says, I don't want your offerings and your new moons and your Sabbath. Stop it all. Right? Is God saying he, he changed his mind on offerings? No, the offerings are not changing the heart of the people. And the people are sitting intentionally and then bringing an offering that is not meant to cover that and they're not repenting and the whole thing is all messed up. Secondly, about the chatat, as Kyle has illuminated us on, is that chatat is not as much about sin as it is about purification. Well, but I thought growing up in Sunday school and Bible Sunday school with felt board Jesus and stickers, star stickers for Bible verses memorized, which I was never really good at, I thought that the main issue was sin. So if Yeshua is a chatat, a sin offering, but a sin offering doesn't really deal with sin, it deals with purification, how, how does that, uh, see, it doesn't really work. We go, well, he's the Passover offering. Okay, what does that mean? I don't know. That's what Paul said. Just what it is, right? So we've, we've had this discussion, and I've really pondered a lot about this because I think it's a fascinating thing. And I know many of you may think, like, why get so in the weeds about it? Who cares? It, it, we know he's our Messiah, period, move on. I can't. I, you know, like when you have a scab, and you're like, I shouldn't be picking this because it's going to make a scar, but I just can't help it. I just have to, like, I have to pick it. I have to. So this is how I am with, with certain topics, especially this one. So th there's, there are other issues with Yeshua being a sacrifice Namely, that in the Torah, Hashem forbids human sacrifice. He forbids it. So there's just a lot of issues, a lot of questions here. They all do have answers. It just not, might be the answers that we know or how to look for them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there's a lot of Jewish writing about a suffering servant and the suffering Zadik, stuff that we may cover at some point. But today, I found this in the Parsha, and I thought... Holy smokeronies, I this is awesome. So we're gonna read in Numbers chapter eight. We're gonna start in verse five after the uh, instructions on the menorah. Chapter eight, verse five. Um, make sure yeah, this is tree of life, so it should be the same numbering. Again, Adonai spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the Levites from among Bene Israel and ceremonially ceremonially cleanse them. That's a hard word to say. This is what you may, must do to them to make them clean. Sprinkle the purifying water on them. By the way, what is the purifying water? 
This is the water of the para aduma, the red heifer. Okay, what does not you? What does the <laughs> what does the water of the para aduma cleanse from? Death, corpse impurity. Very good. I, I stop there because I want you to think. Sprinkle the water of uh, you know the waters of cleansing. That's not just any water. I want you to start connecting these things because this is, these are these are. Uh, threads that we need to understand. And then have them shave their whole bodies and wash their clothes, thus purifying themselves. Then they are to take a young bull with its grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, plus a second young bull for a chatat, a purification offering. See, see how understanding sin offering as purification? What are they going through here? They're going through a purification ceremony, a purification ritual. They're not repenting of sin. They're going through a purification. The repentance of sin is understood in here, okay? Bring the Levites before the tent of meeting and gather the whole community of B'nai Israel. See, we have this, you're setting up the Levites. You're assembling the Levites, but you're also assembling the whole community, the Halutka. And it says, bring the Levites before Adonai. And then check this out. B'nai Israel will lay their hands on the Levites, and Aaron will present the Levites before Adonai as a wave offering from B'nai Israel. See, nobody else is excited. Okay. 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 All right, good. Thank you. I got one. All right. So God says, look, I got to get, get this over here. God says, oh, I lost a wheel. Momentary timeout, technical difficulties. Okay, close enough. God says, hey, um, I want all the, how, how ghetto is this? Okay, I want all of, I want all the nation of Israel's firstborn to be mine, right? But firstborn messed up where? Son of the golden calf, right? Um... So, Levites stepped up, so God said, I'm going to take the Levites. We've heard this in Christianity a long time, but it, it's, it's the same here. You always have, um, you always have the, the thing that God takes from a group. He takes some from out of them to send back to them, right? We, we've understood this in Christianity for a long time, that God uses one like you to save you, which the way we teach Genesis is the same thing. God creates humanity, right? He calls out Adam and Eve to be his representatives, sends Adam and Eve back into the garden where they model a partnership with God for the rest of humanity. So this pattern fits all the way, all the way across. And so he says, bring them before Adonai and have... The nation of Israel lay their hands upon them. Now, all of you good charismatics, what is, what is this ritual about laying of hands? What, what, is about, what is that about? Healing. Healing? Yeah, I mean, that's what we mostly, Im, or importation. What else would you say, Christine? Sharing power. Sharing power, okay. Authority. What, what else? What? Transferring, yeah, transferring, okay. When in the Torah, I'm thinking of two primary times or occur occasions, when does the laying on of hands happen in the Torah? When an offering's presented, and what else? Anointing or ordination, right? Transferring that authority, those, those kinds of things. So, which one is this? It's both. It's both. The reason why I bring this up is because when we read that the nation of Israel, the children of Israel laid their hands on the Levites, that, that's, that doesn't really work in our understanding because when we lay on hands for healing, let's say, you need somebody stronger in faith that's laying their hands on somebody weaker in faith generally, generally. But here you have B'nai Israel laying their hands on their leaders. And so are they transferring some kind of authority or whatever? I think in a way they are. 
And this is the beautiful thing about, about the way that God is setting up this nation as opposed to the way it was in Egypt. In Egypt, they had taskmasters that they did not elect or want or whatever. They were, people were placed over them. They were placed over them in authority. They were placed over them and, and, and were, were, they were commanded to listen to these people at all at any cost, the cost of their lives. God flips the script when he get in, gets into the, into the wilderness and said, no, these people are going to be are going to work for you, and so you get, to, you get to agree. You get to be a part of the process of selecting them and then giving them the authority to serve me on your behalf, which I think is a beautiful thing. But if, we, if that's the only part we see, we're missing a whole half of what's going on here because the text does not focus on Laying on of hands as a transference of authority or as uh, uh, any of those things that we generally think about it. Are you with me so far? Think in your mind of laying on of hands and think about how you understand that. Now understand that this passage is not focusing on that idea at all. All right? But what are the things that come up? What, are the, what is the theme of the, the Levites being presented before God? He says, lay hands on them and then present them as a what? A wave offering. To my knowledge, besides the binding of Isaac, the Akedah, this is the only other time, or the first time for sure after that, that humans are an offering. Now, God forbids human sacrifice. But here, the Levites are described as a wave offering. Hmm. See why it's exciting? Oh, it's exciting. Okay, so as a wave offering... From B'nai Israel. So the nation is giving the Levites as a wave offering. We're going to talk about wave offering um, in a minute. He says, they may go about the work, then they may go about the work of the service of Adonai. The Levites are to lay their hands on the heads of the bulls, use one for sin offering, a hatat, and the other for an olah, a burnt offering to Adonai to make atonement for the Levites. Have the Levites stand before Aaron and his sons and present them as a wave offering to Adonai. There it is again. In this way, you are to set apart the Levites from B'nai Israel to be mine. After you have purified them and presented them as a wave offering, okay, we get it, right? It's three times now. The Levites will come and do their work at the tent of meeting, for they are the ones from among B'nai Israel given to me in place of all the firstborn wombs of B'nai Israel. I have taken them for myself. Quote, for every firstborn among B'nai Israel is mine, whether human or animal, on the day I struck down the firstborn of the land of Egypt, I sanctified them for myself. So I'm taking the Levites in place of the firstborn of B'nai Israel, and I'm giving the Levites as a gift to Aaron and his sons from among B'nai Israel to do the work on behalf of B'nai Israel in the tent of meeting, and to make atonement for them so that there would be no plague among them for coming too close to the sanctuary. Now who's the them here? Not the Levites, but everybody else. So Moses, Aaron, and the entire community of B'nai Israel did so with the Levites. All that Adonai had commanded Moses regarding the Levites, so B'nai Israel did to them. The Levites also purified themselves from sin and washed their clothes. Aaron presented them as a wave offering before Adonai, number four, and he made atonement to purify them. After that, the Levites came to do their task before Aaron and his sons in the tent of meeting, just as Adonai had commanded Moshe concerning the Levites. All right. So we have this whole thing about the wave offering. Now, how many major categories of offering do we have described in the Torah, specifically the book of Leviticus? Five, right? The first five chapters of Vayikra describe the, fir the main types of offerings. And I'm not going to write those down. Those are uh, Ola, the burnt offering, right? I'm not going to get these in order. Then the Shlamim. The peace offering, then the mincha, or the fellowship offering, grain offering, then the chatat, or the purification offering, and then the asham, 
which is the guilt offering, what we call the guilt offering, okay? So thanks to my teacher, Joe Good, I have this handy-dandy um, this list of stuff. So whenever you bring an offering in the tabernacle and the temple, there is a prescribed way that it is brought, okay? You don't just drag your goat up there and, you know, give it to one of the Levites and go, put a check mark by my name, I'm out. Like, it's not, it's not like we give money in, you know, in the, in the, the thing, like I just throw it, whatever. It's not, it's, it's a very, it's a choreographed process, right? So uh, first is called the Hava'ah, which is the bringing. So there is a, there is a choreography to bringing the offering. Second is the Simicha. Simicha is the laying on of hands. Now, Simicha is laying on of hands. When I got ordained, Joe and uh, a couple of other folks laid hands on me. Smicha is also thought of as authority, right? A, a, a teacher in Judaism doesn't teach. They're not able to teach. They're not allowed to teach unless they have smicha, which is one of the issues that Yeshua dealt with. They go, well, like, why is he, how can he teach like this? He's from Galilee, right? In other words, where does his smicha come from? It's a big deal in Judaism. See, in Christianity, anybody can open a church and do whatever they want. But in Judaism, there is a tradition and there is a line, there's an accountability that someone from above you or someone from before you has to give you smicha, has to give you authority in order to teach. But, and that comes through the laying on of hands like we talked about before. So the second part is smicha where you lay on hands. The third part is called vidui. We've talked about vidui before. This is confession. Now, the confession does not always mean you're confessing sin. If it is that, it is that. But not every offering has to deal with sin, right? Matter of fact, only like maybe two-fifths, maybe, depending on how you, how you think about the last two. But the vidui is just what is the purpose of this offering? Why am I bringing it? Who am I, son of, daughter of, whatever, and why am I bringing this offering? It may be a testimony for God's goodness of thanks or whatever it might be. Next, four is the shkita, which is the actual slaughtering. Shkita is the slaughtering. A kosher butcher is called a shochet. Shkita, shochet, okay. Um, this is the actual slaughtering where uh, they lay the animal down and they say a blessing, super, 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 super razor sharp knife, one quick, uh, one quick slice, and then they hang the animal up for the, bl the blood to drain before they, they skin it out. Uh, number five is uh, Kabbalah Hadam. This is, what does the word Kabbalah mean? To receive or to welcome, right? So we have on the night before, on the evening of Shabbat, before Shabbat, there is a service that some of you do called Kabbalah Shabbat. Kabbalat Shabbat is welcoming or receiving the Sabbath. It's a whole, it's prayers and blessings and songs. This is receiving the blood. So as the animal hangs, the blood is manipulated, right? The blood has to be kept moving or else it coagulates. Next is holacha. Well, we know this word. What does holacha mean? To walk. So this is where the blood is taken from the animal and it is moved around, and it is walked to where? The altar, right? Okay. Number seven is called zerika. Zerika is the actual sprinkling of the blood, and the blood is thrown on the altar. Okay, so you see this progression that is that happens during every offering. Number eight. This is a long one. Um, Shefichat, Shefichat, uh, Shefichat Sheraim. Sorry if you can't read that, I'm running out of room. 
Shefichat Shiraim. I'll have this later if you. Um, this is pouring out the leftover blood. Now, where do you pour out the leftover blood? Base of the altar, there are drains in the base of the altar that go down and out into the Kidron Valley. Kidron Valley. And there's all there's a whole system. It's it's really fascinating. Um, okay, do y'all have this top part for those of you that are taking notes? I don't have a I don't have a thingy. Um, here. I will, um, I think I've uploaded this before, but if not, I will, uh, try to get this scanned and upload it this week, uh, so that y'all, y'all can see it. Um, next, number nine is, uh, Hafshata. Uh, yeah, Venetiok. And this is the skinning and severing. So you have the slaughter, right? Then it's hung. You have the receiving of the blood. You have the walking. It's a flash on the altar. Empty the blood. Then you come back to the animal, and it is skinned and uh, quartered or severed. Then number 10 is... Hadaka. This is rinsing, where the animal is rinsed. And then number 11, Melicha. Uh, Vihaktra. This is the salting and burning. So, see this, uh, this, this, uh, this whole series, 11 steps to how you bring an offering and how it works. Now, there's one step in here that is not mentioned in this list that does show up throughout the Torah. And that is a step called tenufa or tenufa. This is the wave, the wave offering. Technically called the wave offering or called the wave offering, but technically not an offering itself. It's part always attached to another offering. Okay, so we're going to read about some of these. So uh, Exodus 29, 19, uh, verse 9. You can just write these verses down if you don't want to uh, flip to them because they're not on the screen. Exodus 29, 19. It says, then take the other ram and have Aaron and his sons lay his hands upon the head of that ram. Right, we talked about that. Slaw the ram, take its blood, dab it on the right ear of Aaron and on the right ears of his sons, on the thumb of their right hands and on the big toes of their right feet. Then pour the blood on the altar all around. Also you to take some of the blood that is on the altar along with the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and his garments and on his sons and their garments. In this way, uh, he and his garments are to be consecrated along with his sons and their garments. Moreover, take some of the fat of that ram along with the fat tail the fat that covers the innards and covering the liver, the two kidneys and the fat that is on them along with the right thigh because it is a ram of consecration. Also take one loaf of bread, one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer out of the basket of matzah that is before Adonai. You are to put the entirety into Aaron's hands and the hands of his sons and present them as a wave offering before Adonai. So see, this wave part is a part of a larger offering, okay? In Leviticus 7, verse 29, it says, Speak to B'nai Israel, saying, Whoever brings the sacrifices of his fellowship offerings to Adonai is to present his offering to Adonai out of the sacrifice of his fellowship offerings. With his own hands, he is to bring Adonai's offerings by fire. We looked at that, the bringing of the offering. That's the first part. He is to present the fat with the breast so that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before Adonai. Okay, there it is again. And then in Leviticus 23, we have two separate festivals where we're commanded to wave something. Now, not Kyle. Can anybody else tell me, can anybody tell me what the two festivals are that we're commanded to wave something and what we're commanded to wave? Does, does anybody know? First fruits or Shavuot, we're to wave what? The grain, the om, or the, 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 the uh, loaves, yes. What else? Sukkot, what are we to wave? Lulav, right. There is a third one. There is the one, there is the Omer that is actually during Passover. 
That's a wave offering as well, the omer, okay? So Leviticus 23 um, explains those, and uh, we're not going to take time to read them now because I talked too much at the beginning. So this wave, what is this wave offering? What is this thing? Let's keep in mind everything that we've kind of covered so far. We have the Levites. The firstborn was supposed to be fully consecrated to Hashem, right, for the service of God. They blew it. Now the Levites become that in their place. They become this fully consecrated, surrendered, uh, you know, sold out people, consecrated to God for his work. All the wave offering is, I want to read these, these couple of quotes because I think it's really, it says it better than I could probably say it. The wave offering is part of the other offerings. It was a symbolic act indicating that the offering was holy for Hashem. It is, uh, and I said another way, it is a way to acknowledge that the safety of the thing or the success of the activity which is represented by the offering, is in God's hands. It is simply a way of, of separating and setting apart that offering completely for Hashem. Now, the irony about this is that as we read through, read through some of these passages, the offering is completely for Hashem. So what offering of the five major kinds that we've talked about is completely consumed for Hashem? Which one? The Ola, the burnt offering. So let me ask you this. Is the wave offering completely consumed by fire? No. It is completely for Hashem, but is not completely consumed. What happens to the wave offering after it is waved? It goes to the priests and Levites. So for their use and for their, their, for their own, own use. So we have all this stuff about wave offering, wave offering, wave offering, wave offering. And we have these people, these Levites. Now, it's funny, in, in rabbinic commentary, in Jewish commentary, they spent a lot of time talking about, does anybody know how many Levites we're talking about? 22,000 is the count that, that is given in, in commentary. 22,000. Now, the rabbis and the sages spent a lot of time talking about the strength of Moshe and Aaron, being able to physically wave 22,000 Levites before Hashem. <laughs> I just think that's fantastic. Do I think that Moshe and Aaron picked up the Levites and, and waved? Because there's a, there's a specific way that we do wave, and we'll talk about that in just a minute. A specific way. People go, well, like, what is the way? How do you wave? How do you wave? It's like, hey, here it is. What is the Hi, here's my offering. What is the wave offering? It is a specific prescripted uh, choreographed movement, like everything else is in the temple. And you think, like, well, like, why does everything have to be so exact? If you come before the Queen of England or the President of the United... If you come before the Queen of England, <laughs> there is such a heaviness and a respect there that... You want things to be right, and if they're not right, somebody is going to correct you because of the office, because of what it represents. How much more for the king of the universe when we're in his house about to sit down to eat together, right? So everything is very scripted. Have any of you ever watched the series Downton Abbey? Come on, help me out. Oh, come on. Okay, good. All right. Downton. Okay, if you haven't and you got some extra time. Be careful because you'll get sucked in. It's fantastic. The reason why, it's like, a, it's like a late 1800s British soap opera set in a castle. I don't know. It's, it's just awesome. I don't know. I just, I loved it. The thing, one of the things that I love most about it is the, the butler, right? The, the, the head butler. How exacting he was on everything. The silver, the placement, the way that, that, people moved in throughout the house everything was exacting because because of the way that that was his job his job was to coordinate all the activities of the house the way the food was served the way it was prepared the timing all, just all these things and and I just I think about that and I think about that's that's Aaron and his sons and the Levites in God's house 
it, I, I don't want to, we think of the term butler and sometimes we think of that as a demeaning term because they're just a servant. But the but, a good butler in a good home is the reason the house functions. I learned that from Downton Abbey. <laughs> but but actually, actually, and this is how my brain works. Actually, I actually did a lot of research on butlery because of the show. Because this is a world I don't know anything about. Like, I, never, I know butler. I've never even met a real butler. I don't even know what you have to do to have a butler. Like, I don't understand that. But, so, yeah, money. I, yeah, money is number one. But the, the whole world of butlering is, was, just became fascinating to me. The house, the estate, the whatever, that family's life doesn't work if that butler is not on his game or her, or, you know, is, is not coordinating right and doesn't do a good job. So we talk about it in a lowly sense, but actually it's a very elevated position. They're the most trusted person in that house. They know everything. And they're responsible for everything and accountable for everything. And they are, they are kind of pulled in both ways. They're pulled by the family, but they also have to care for the other servants. So there's this, this in-between place that they live in all the time. So th- this, if we think about Aaron as the Kohen Gadol, as the head butler of the temple, and we think about the, his sons and the, the Levites as the rest of the staff serving in the king's palace. We think about it like that. Aaron is the one that is responsible for making sure that the services are done right, making sure that the, the, the animals, the offerings are correct, making sure that the Levites are in their places at certain times, and all these things. Uh, I can't remember the guy's name on Downton Abbey. What's the butler's name? Huh? Carson, thank you. Yeah, um, he's great. Uh, anyway, sorry. The, the, the job of the Kohen Gadol is to make sure that everything is in line. Everything is right because you're entertaining the presence of the king of the universe, not just some earthly king, right? So everything is prescribed. So this wave offering, in the sense of, of it being a, an, uh, an acknowledgement of, of God's providence and his, his, the, the surrender of that thing to him completely, right? And so in, uh, how, does this, how does this work? So in Sukkot, uh, during Sukkot, we have the, um, the offerings, uh, the lulav, which is called in Hebrew, arba menim, arba menim, which means the four kinds or the four species, arba meaning four. We have the etrog, we have the lulav, which the lulav just refers to the palm, which is the biggest part. Um, and that's actually the lulav, but we call the whole thing the lulav just because it's easier. The etrog, the lulav, the hadas, which is the myrtle, and the arava, which is the willow. So you have four different species, arba minim. Now, why is it important? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but I know and I can imagine for each and every one of us, you buy this lulav and etrog at Sukkot, you're not 100% sure why you're buying it. I mean, like, you have a good idea, it's commanded, but not real sure what the big deal is about. And then we all get together, and we go, okay, we're going to wave the lulav. And don't raise your hands. How many of you feel absolutely stupid, right? Oh, okay, you can wave your hands, wave your hand, raise your hand. You feel, right, okay. I think the reason why we don't, we don't, in, it's supposed to, this is Zaman Simchatenu. This is the season of our joy. This is the thing, waving this lulav and this etrog is the thing that we look forward to all year. Really? Yeah. In Israel, there's just throngs of people. And they all have, people spend weeks. They go to the shuk, to the market, and they, and they look, and they look at the myrtle, and they, they go, oh, no, not that one. They look at all, all this myrtle, all this lulav, all this hadas, all these etrog that are, and they, they you know, like you, you've seen the movie uh, that we watched uh, uh, with the, what is it? Ushpazin. You know, like, like with like the jewelers thing, you know, 
They, but this is a thing. What separates their joy and the time that they take and the celebration that, that ensues over the lulav, what separates that and their attitude from ours that are here in Rose Pine feeling dumb and out of place waving these sticks around? What is the difference? What separate, what, what creates that chasm between us? I think it's understanding. I think it's knowledge and understanding. Why are we doing this? This doesn't make any sense. Now, understand, again, that the, the wave, the waving is a symbol to God of complete surrender of that thing, of what that thing represents, that it is a dedication only for him, okay? Now, how do we wave? There is a specific way that we wave any part of an offering, and that is always facing which direction? Guess. East, always facing Jerusalem, right? Always facing Jerusalem. If you're in Jerusalem, you face the Temple Mount. If you're in the Temple Mount, you face the altar in the holy place. Yeah, the holy place, right? Yeah, you get it. So we're facing east. So first, we wave three times to the front, three times to our right, three times behind us, three times to the left, three times above us, and three times below us. If you don't recognize, that is all-encompassing, right? This is that complete submission and complete and total giving over of whatever we're offering to Hashem. So to wrap this up, let's just talk about specifically Sukkot. Think about the significance of this, of this wave part, as we talk about Pesach and the Omer. We're told that on the morrow after Shabbat, whatever that means, we're to go out, right, and get an Omer, and we're to wave it before Hashem. What crop is Israel waving before Hashem? Barley. The first of the barley harvest. So what does that tell us about waving the barley harvest before Hashem? It's a recognition, a physical way. This is the beautiful thing about the Torah. It's a physical way of reminding ourselves that we have nothing. We would not have this barley were it not for the providence of Hashem. And it may seem like, oh, well, that's kind of silly. I can just thank Him in my heart. You can, but eventually, as human beings, you're going to get to where your heart forgets to thank Him. Don't believe me? Think back on your life. This is the beautiful thing about the Torah is that God instructs us to do physical things because he knows if we just try to mentally elevate, that doesn't work. We need tactile things. Why do we raise our hands in worship? Why do we wave our hands in worship? It's a sign of what? Full surrender. Right? So, Waving the barley. And then we're told to count 50 days and then to wave another offering. What is that? The wheat. That's the wheat harvest. We wave the wheat harvest. We bake it into loaves of leavened bread and the priest waves that before Hashem. Right? And so he takes the two loaves and he waves, 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 right? All the way around clockwise above and below again as a sign that you we trusted you for rain hey we've got livestock personally it hasn't rained well it rained day before yesterday we've been in a drought for yeah it's it's sprinkled it turned the grass green a little bit it hadn't rained in three months a month two months whatever it has been and it's been hot as blue blazes you know what's something that we really don't connect with? It's the, the drawing of the water at Sukkot. Because we tie it all to Yeshua, and that's great. But the fact of the matter is, they were drawing water because the end of Sukkot is all about praying for and believing for rain. Because rain is life. You don't believe it? I spent $300 this week on hay shipped in from Arizona 
because my pastures are dead and I've got young lambs that I'm trying to raise up to sell. I have the space. What I don't have is the rain. When your life as an agricultural society depends on rain, we go like, why this big celebration all for rain? Who cares? Like, turn the tap on if you need water. Yeah, dig a well. Like, it's no big deal. How many of you ever actually physically hand dug a well? Yeah, one, maybe two of you. Like, just, yeah, like, go, just go dig a well in your backyard. Why not? Just go punch a hole in the ground. No. Rain, water from heaven, is the difference between existing and not existing. Listen, I don't mean to be like alertist and alarmist, and I'm not a conspiracy person. I, I can't afford to be a conspiracy person because it swallows me. So I have to keep a distance. But if our economy continues to go the way it is, let, let, let me just be really divisive and political for a minute, okay? Certain people, certain groups of people in our country are tanking our economy on purpose, we know that. It's not a secret. They've said it. We want to end fossil fuels. So how do you do that? Well, we're not going to give up fossil fuels because that, like, everything revolves around that. It's like our water today. So how do you get it? How do you get us loose from it? You make it so expensive that it implodes on itself. And then, ta-da, no more fossil fuels. Everybody is devastated, and the whole country is devastated, but at least we don't have fossil fuels anymore. This is the way that you do it. You create so much chaos and so much that something implodes. And that way you can say, well, we didn't do it. Yeah, you did. Anyway, okay, that was my rant. <laughs> Let's just dream a little bit and think a little bit that in five years, Electricity is going to be so expensive that you literally cannot afford it. You think, well, I can't imagine that. How many of you are putting off trips because you don't want to pay the gas bill? Imagine electricity being so expensive you can't afford it in another five to ten years. I'm not saying that's going to happen. I don't believe it's going to happen. We have a great way of correcting. America has a great way of correcting, self-correcting. But let's just say that. Well, you know what? No electricity, you don't have running water. We, because we're so spoiled and so comfortable, we don't understand what kind of crisis that is. Then, what do you do for water? You believe God. That's what you do. You believe God. And you know what? If you get thirsty enough, you will resort to any and all kinds of of embarrassing and outlandish things in order to move heaven and earth to give you water. You'll even go to the, to the extreme of dancing and waving twigs around, hoping and trusting that God will, see, will find favor with you and send water in its season. Does that give us a little bit of understanding about what this waving thing is all about? The Indians had rain dance. They, they focused completely on the creator as the one who supplied that. It, it, it's, not these, it's not the Indians, it's not the ancient Israelites, it's not the Jewish people that are weird for doing these things. It's us that's weird. We're the ones that don't get it. We're the ones that are so we just open on a faucet. Or, hey, have four or five going in the house at one time. Who cares? <laughs> it's just water. We're the ones that don't have it right. That we don't need God in that aspect. So during Sukkot, we wave the Arba Manim. Now here's where it really gets fun, and we'll wrap up with this. The, the Lulav, the Arba Manim, has, it's so cool. What, are the, what, are the, what is the greatest commandment? Love Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and strength. All your moed, all your very. What's the second one? Love your neighbors yourself. Did you know that Judaism teaches that the lulav has two functions? That it, sh it teaches us how to relate to others and how to relate to Hashem. Man, that Yeshua was a smart dude. 
No, he lived in a, he was, but he lived in a culture that understood these things. So I can imagine that when, when the question was posed to him, um, hey, great teacher, what is the greatest commandment? The lulav would have been in his mind because it relates to other people and it relates to our holiness before God. So in relation to others, the etrog, the citron, has a good taste and a good fragrance. It represents a person with both wisdom in the Torah and good deeds. The hadas, the myrtle, has a good fragrance, but it is inedible. It represents a person who has good deeds, but lacks wisdom. The lulav, the palm, is edible, but has no smell. This represents the person with wisdom, but without good deeds. You know those people. They know it all, but they never do anything with it. Lastly, the arava, the willow, has neither taste nor smell. It represents a person with neither good deeds nor Torah learning. So, we have our lulav, and we're waving it before Hashem, doing Sukkot. I'm going to let you simmer on this. Knowing what we know about the wave offering and what we know about this aspect of the lulav, what does that teach us? What is that supposed to teach us? That's your homework. What about relationship to self? I love this. The etrog, the citron, represents the heart. The seed of our emotions, our mind, our will. The hadas, the myrtle, has leaves shaped like an eye. Be careful, little eyes, what you see. The date palm, the lulav, represents the spine, the backbone, the core, strength. It's where our actions come from. And lastly, the arava, the willow, represents its shape, looks like lips, represents our speech. So as we're waving the lulav, knowing what we know about waving, there's a lot to think about. See, it's not about just shaking stuff. Uh, shaking it. You shake a lulav, it's going to fall apart. You shake an arba minim, it's gonna, you know, those of you that have owned one, you know how delicate they are. How delicate are these parts of our lives? So delicate that if they're not in full submission to Hashem, they bring destruction. There are so many connections to be made here that I just want you to simmer on this week. Back to the very beginning. This, besides, like I said, the binding of Isaac, the Akedah, this is the first time and the only time that I know of, I'm sure there are others that I haven't come across yet, where people are talked about as an offering. Why is that so important and why is that so intriguing to me? It's intriguing to me because Yeshua as a sacrifice has so many problems. But Yeshua as an offering, as a korban, and we've talked about this before. Korban meaning to draw near. That's what korban means. Yeshua being a korban, drawing us near to the Father. Not only initially, but every day, every moment, continually, as we think about his life and his teachings, continually drawing us near. He is truly the eternal offering. When Shaul says one, uh, sacrifice once for all, we've interpreted that to mean, oh, well, he put an end to sacrifices. I don't read it like that. He's an offering once for all, meaning continually. He's continually drawing us, continually connecting us, continually bringing us closer to the Father if we'll listen to him and follow him. Much like the Levites in our Torah portion. See, the thing that's so fascinating about the Levites as a wave offering, full submission, is that it sets a precedent for Yeshua as the Messiah being called an offering. Does that make sense? Because what we have created in Christianity is the law and the sacrifices. 
that were given to appease an angry God or, at worst, to manipulate him like a spiritual genie. We need rain, we'll do these funky dances. We need forgiveness, we'll go spill a lot of blood. Which to most of us makes no sense. And how many of us have sat in church in our past and thought, I'm so glad, or heard from the pulpit, I'm so glad I didn't live back then. In a way, we needed to make it so mangled and misunderstood and negative because that would make Jesus so great. Because Jesus' distinction, Jesus' is the, the kind of the wham-pow of Jesus in how is, is in how he's different than everything before him. Right? The, 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 the power of Jesus is because he was, he's so different than those poor Israelites had to live through. And in that attitude, we've destroyed Yeshua, the Jew from Nazareth, the Messiah. And we've created a bipolar God, and we've created a Bible that is split in two halves, and things that don't make sense that you can't understand. The convenience of that way of thinking about it is that now you can make Jesus anything you want. He can be a sacrifice. It doesn't matter the Torah d- condemns that. That's what he is because we've done away with all of that stuff. And now we can make it mean anything we want it to mean. And yet, I don't find power in Yeshua's distinction. I find power in how he is just like everything that came before him. How he is the ultimate step in the process. How he's the the knot at the end of the thread that runs all through scripture. That's where the power of the Messiah is. Because if I can see a concept in the Torah and see it repeated in the New Testament, that's a thing. That shows continuity and consistency and legacy and tradition. And there's power in that not power in the new and the flashy that's going to fade over time. These Levites being totally dedicated to God were waved before Hashem by Moses and Aaron who had incredible strength and endurance. They were waved before Hashem as a sign of complete surrender. The people laid their hands on them not as transferring authority but as an offering. I think that's really phenomenal. So, I hope this provokes you to think about it a little bit. Next time you're in prayer, next time you're in prayer and worship, maybe, maybe instead of lifting hands like this, maybe we, maybe we wave before Hashem in the prescribed way. The way that Hashem understands as worship. Not saying that God doesn't understand this. He didn't prescribe this. He prescribed this as a wave, fully dedicating whatever we're representing to him. And that's beautiful.